So ladies and gentlemen, by the, the time I met the great Barry Morris at Dalhousie Regional High School when he was doing a literacy tour with uh, membership base uh, award-winning writer <clears throat> David Adam Richards, he had already done The Fugitive, he had already done Canadian stage plays, he had already done The Twilight Zone, he had already done The Martian Chronicles, Space 1999. <clears throat> I had a chance to speak to him for a short while, but I didn't have a chance to ask him the question. How come you only did one episode of The Twilight Zone? Now, the one he did, I consider this a minor classic because uh, Mr. Fitzgerald Fortune is probably the best uh, character name in uh, TZ history. And this episode was written by, of all people, Earl Habner of Walton's fame. It's called A Piano in the House. This is episode uh, 87 of the American TV series The Twilight Zone. And it was the Valentine's Week episode aired on February 16, 62. In this one, according to Rod, Mr. Fitzgerald Fortunate, teeter critic and cynic at large on his way to a birthday party. If he knew what is in store for him, he probably wouldn't go because before this evening is over, that cranky old piano uh, is going to play those piano roll blues with some effects that could only happen in the Twilight Zone. Now in this one, uh, Fortune, again a drama critic, is a caustic and cruel man, goes to Throckmorton's curio shop to buy his wife, Esther, a, a curio, a player piano, as a 26th birthday present. The grouchy owner demonstrates the piano by playing a roll of music inside. As in plays, I'm in the mood for love, he began speaking in a gentle, sentimental manner, even giving Fitzgerald a 20% discount because it was a gift. When the music stops, the owner resumes his ill-tempered sniping. After Esther asks why, after she has often said that she wants to learn to play the piano, that her husband bought her a player piano. He cheerfully tells her that this will save her the time and expense of taking piano lessons, only to find that she has no talent for the instrument. As he demonstrates the piano by playing a role for the song Smiles from the passing show of 1918, the fortunes normally solemn butler Marvin in a very, very uh, strong performance by Cyril uh, Delavante begins to grin brightly. He says that he's happy because he's well paid, enjoys his work, and likes his two employers. When Fitzgerald protests that he treats Marvin poorly, Marvin reveals he finds his ego and temper amusing to the point where he frequently has to restrain himself from laughing out loud. Again, this change ends with the two when the tune does. Now, Fitzgerald suspects that the piano makes people reveal their innermost thoughts, depending on who inserts the role and what particular song is played. He attests his further by playing a role, a role for a Noctorian Sabre Dance on the piano for Esther. She says she hates him and believes that he married her because he wanted someone to bully rather than love. She attributes her marrying him to youthful Nia Naite. I think she was only 20 uh, in the plot. Satisfied with the piano's performance, Fitzgerald decides to use it on the birthday party guests. The first guest to arrive is the playwright Gregory Walker. Gregory professes a distaste for any emotional involvement, but Fitzgerald plays a role for these foolish things remind me of you. And as it plays, Gregory admits to strong feelings for Esther and even confesses that he had a tryst while she was on vacation. Esther answers and she's mortified and implores for Gerald not to play the piano to the other guests. Now the rest of the guests arrive. Marge Moore is the life of the party, enjoying the food and company while making jokes about her heavy set figure. When no one immediately volunteers for Gerald's party game, he picks Marge as the first to listen to piano. As the piano plays Debussy's Claire de Lune, Marge goes into trance and is identifying her as a little girl named Tina who loves to dance ballet. Fitzgerald encourages her to demonstrate, and she does so, prompting laughter from all the party guests except Esther and Gregory. Uh, with further prompting, Marge speaks dreamily about her desire to be a tiny, perfectly formed snowflake, melting it on the hand of a man who loves her. The guests stop laughing while Fortune continues to roar with glee. The song ends, and the humiliated Marge takes her seat. Fitzgerald then has Esther insert a new role, which he claims to bring out the devil among them. He hands her a role for the song Melody in F, but she secretly switches roles. The piano begins to play her Brahms lullaby. The music makes Fitzgerald speak in a petulant, frightened young man's voice. At the guest prompting, he admits that deep down he's selfish and a spoiled child who is terrified of everything and everyone. Lashing out on everyone and hurting them because it's the only means of expressing himself, he knows, and fearing they will hurt him if he doesn't. He confesses that he humiliated Marge because he's jealous of her eagerness for life, despite her insecurities and deliberately wrote bad reviews of Gregory's plays out of pure spite when he should have praised them because he's jealous of his talent. Now, feeling pity for him, the guests leave without comment. 
Fitzgerald makes his final confession. He treated Esther with coldness and cruelty because he lacks the emotional maturity to receive and reciprocate uh, her love. I'm going to be naughty. Gregory asks Esther to leave with him, and she does so, leaving Fitzgerald alone. Now Fitzgerald, distraught at being abandoned, feels insulted and throws a tantrum, destroying furniture and decorations in the room. He ends his tirade by ripping the roll from the piano, ending the piano spelling him. As he kneels on the ground, Marvin enters, remembering his earlier confession. Fitzgerald orders Marvin not to laugh at him. A somber Marvin replies, I'm not laughing, Mr. Fortune. You're not funny anymore. Now, according to Serling's closing narration, Mr. Fitzgerald Fortune, a man who went searching for concealed persons and found himself in the Twilight Zone. A very, very strongly acted episode. Could easily be done on the stage. I think a bottle episode like this would be tremendous to be taken up by kind of a, a, a what do you call, a, a, a theater to a group in their 30s or 40s. But Barry Morris is uh, far, far away from his Gerard character from Fugitive, far away from, again, his Space 1999 character. This is a cruel man, and Barry Morris can play anything. But to see a, such a kind and gentle person, I found Barry Morris to be probably one of the most important non-Canadian-born actors in Canadian history. I remember when the Terry Fox uh, uh, telethon was going, we were trying to raise $1.00 for every Canadian in Canada, which I think is like 27 million. And Barry Morris was there uh, fighting for the rest of us to, to, to help Terry in his efforts to help stop cancer. Now, Barry Morris, I think the reason why Canadians love Barry Morris so much is because he would be a different character. Now, he did not ap appear in Star Trek, the classic series, which I don't really understand. And to my memory, I don't think he appeared in a lot of the thriller series of the, uh, the 60s. But by the time he ended up in Space 1999, I think the reason why the show was so successful worldwide, because this is Barry Morse. Like I said, he's a household name in so many households, but to other people, he's that guy. You remember Barry Morse for a myriad of roles. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, what he does here is just amazing because the, the, the acting is effortless. Maybe somebody like Will Gear is the only comparison one we can talk about. And, of course, Barry with his one-man show and different stuff. Now, he acted, ladies and gentlemen, for 70 years, from 1937, literally to almost his death in 2007. Now, uh, the, uh, the website is still there, by the way, barrymorris.com, uh, Star British Stage, all uh, different matters. And uh, the, uh, the idea about... Uh, he selected for uh, filmography the uh, the fugitive. Oh, he did. He wasn't one of the other limits, and one episode of the Invaders. So thank God, I, I kind of uh, lost my mind for a second. But he was uh, again Space 1999 is Victor Bergman, one of the best sci-fi performances of all time. But the Martian Chronicles 1980 was around the same time that I saw him, and also in the Canadian uh, hit uh, The Changeling, and he was also on the New Twilight Zone. An episode called Dreamy of Life in the, the Canadian uh, versions. And also he's in War Remembrance. So ladies and gentlemen, what a what an episode, what a what a cast, and everything in this is perfect. So ladies and gentlemen, if you like what you're doing here, we're a Twilight Zone podcast. Let us know with a like, comment, subscribe, or share.